wonderful Park and Rec superintendent lady. Um, and I want to say thank you to everybody for participating for these uh, six weeks uh, separated by a few to get through all of our six hamlets. So um, now we've reached the end of the ABCs and we've reached um, the end of our six hamlet tour with Wakabuck and the Three Lakes area because you really can't separate them. Um, Wakabuck is one of the Three Lakes and they are all probably part of the, or probably the most scenic part of town. Anyway, we are here and my uh, modus operandi is to start with a map overview as we usually do, and then to stroll along Mead Street, then to um, cross the lakes and um, talk about Victorian times in the Three Lake area. Also at that point, then we will be segueing to talk about the Twin Lakes area, the South Wakabuck Association area, the Lake Wakabuck Association. There are, uh, there are many, many different time periods of development in this area. After we've talked a little bit, and I've really confused you maybe about all these places, we are going to uh, take a quick trip up the mountain and go visit Mountain Lakes Park. And we will finish with a history uh, of some of the exciting things, interesting things that happened in Mountain Lakes Park. Uh, along the way, I will talk about at least one legend and uh, maybe a couple of ghost stories along the way. There's a lot to cover. And when I said, let's not just do walk book, let's do the Three Lakes area as well. Uh, I didn't realize how much uh, information that all entails. So I hope I hope you can stick with us through all 95 slides and or pictures and uh, some are just quickies. But first of all, we'll uh, go to, I'm hoping everybody can see the Lake Wakabuck, the, I'm sorry, the entering Wakabuck sign. And if we can, uh, it is, it was declared a historic district. The whole <clears throat> Mead Street area was declared uh, a national historic landmark uh, historic district. We will start our trip with the usual maps. Uh, this is an 1858 map of, um, part of part of Westchester County. And uh, we will be basically talking about this area right here, the Three Lakes area, Wakabuck, Ripawam, and Oskaleta. At the time of this map's uh, publication, Wakabuck was named uh, South Lake. Actually, Wakabuck was known as North Lake for a while. Uh, the whole area was known as Long Pond back in the early 1700s when the uh, European settlers were buying it from the, from the Indians. Uh, here we have Ripawam with no name at this point and just these two lakes. I want to mention the name of up here. This is actually North Salem, but uh, George Bailey's name will come back into play in the, when we talk about Mountain Lakes Camp, because all of all of this area in here with the north side of, of Lake Ripawam is a, a Westchester County Park called uh, Mountain Lakes, Sal Precioso Mountain Lakes Park. Uh, for the last time, we're going to talk about the oblong. And this was um, from an 1860s pamphlet about the oblong and about all of the excursions to, to map the oblong, which is uh, the area of land called the equivalent lands, which was exchanged between New York State. Well, they weren't states at that point, the territory of New York and the territory of Connecticut. And this map was drawn to show how there were some discrepancies between the surveyor's journeys in 1725 and 1731. And in 1731, the final line was, was made. Um, and I'm not sure which line is which, but it looks like this is the more substantial line. So this is showing how they went back and redid 
all of the mapping from <clears throat> the uh, Long Island Sound from the shore. Here's where Lewis Bro starts. And um, up here, it's going to go all through Lewis Bro, <clears throat> mapping 20 miles from the Hudson River east. So, um, and the lands are going to be exchanged between, between those two entities of New York and Connecticut. Uh, <clears throat> In Lake Wakabuck, oh, well, the line, the, uh, let me just go back a minute. The Van Cortland Manor came from the Hudson River over to where the oblong discrepancy and border border was. So um, this was supposed to be an even 20 miles as near as they could make it from the Hudson all the way up to the Massachusetts border. Basically in our, in our town, in our area, follows Route 22 pretty far, uh, pretty straight north. The Wakabuck, Wakabuck Lake, the, east, the western end of Wakabuck Lake uh, is the point in our town where, well, one of the points where um, the line goes right through the lake and it also goes through, it went through the golf course and I think it was on the 13th tee the manor line meets the uh, oblong line, and there's supposedly a stone wall on that 13th tee to indicate where the oblong and the uh, Van Cortlandt manor, I think, and where they meet. Here's just a close up of that other one where we see North Pond, South Pond, Wakabak, and uh, we're right into North Salem here. All of this will be Mountain Lakes Park town of South Salem. And uh, over here is Mead Street. Here we have Benedict Road, Post Office Road, and, and Mead Street starting down here where um, nowadays it's Route 35. And here's Mead Street going all the way up, continues on, becomes um, Post Road in North Salem. And here it goes down to, it. this would pretty much be what now is Chapel Road, working its way down to what is now 138 and then all the way over to Golden Spread. So enough of those maps, there are a few more maps to come. In preparing for this talk, there are two wonderful books that um, I used. Actually, I'd had a hand <clears throat> in doing a little bit in each of these books. This was just written last year um, and published by the Three Lakes Council, being a 50 year since the Three Lakes Council was celebrating their, their 50th anniversary. Um, Jan, um, Jan Anderson and uh, Jean Lewis and a, a committee of people worked on this booklet uh, telling the history of the Three Lakes. Uh, it's, it's probably a booklet available at the library, but it, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, quick look back at all the things that have happened in the last two or 300 years. The other booklet that um, is fun to look at, again, a uh, copy at the library. I know I have a copy in my office. It's the Wakabuck Country Club, 100 Years of Friendship and Fun, a wonderful book that put together. Uh, celebrating 100 years of Wakabuck Country Club, which also includes the history of the Mead family and a history of the other families that have made this northern section of town so much fun to be part of. Uh, now we'll get a little scientific. And with this map, this is from the, um, the Reflections on the Three Lakes Council 50th anniversary booklet, but it shows the watershed that these three lakes encompass. Um, this going across into the Connecticut area, this is all very mountainous. And um, as we all know, uh, Ridgefield is Ridgefield because there are a lot of ridges in, in Ridgefield, Connecticut. <laughs> um, over here in Lake Wakabuck, the outlet from Lake Wakabuck eventually feeds into the Cross River, which feeds into the reservoir system, which feeds into the drinking system for New York City. So keeping these areas as pristine 
and technologically sound as you can is very important, not just for Lewisboro, Westchester County, but the uh, larger communities as far south as New York City. This was another chart that was in the, um, the Three Lakes Council booklet. And just to kind of show us what we're dealing with with the Three Lakes, the surface area, Ripawam is the smallest. Actually, it's, it's only half the size of Oscalita, 34 acres, 65 acres, and then Wakabuck doubles the size and is even larger than these two put together at 138 acres. The depth, Ripawam being the most shallow, Oscalita and Wakabuck not too far distant in, in depth. The volume though, in millions of gallons, goes from 150 for Rip, over to 3,696 uh, millions of gallons for Lake Wakabuck. Um, and the watershed size. I'm not going to worry about flushing the lakes. That's something I don't know a whole lot about. But um, as far as the watershed size, you can see it goes from a small, small much acreage to uh, many, 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 10 times at least that. So uh, that's kind of a, a a scientific look at the Three Lakes. One more Three Lakes area, which um, just some things I'll be talking about. <clears throat> this is a map that Carol Barrett did with data from Ken Saltez back when we were writing the uh, Big Blue History Book of Lewis Grow. So this comes from the, uh, the 1981 History of Lewis Grow edition. Here the lakes all have their right names now. Uh, and Carol gives some dates for most of the important places. But some of the places we're gonna talk about will be the Swinging Bridge, Sarah Bishop's, um, Sarah Bishop's Rock, her cave. Um, and up here, which uh, George Bailey, who we saw in North Salem, the highest point in Westchester County is Bailey Mountain, and that's 982 feet. And that is the highest point in Westchester County. Think of that 982 when we read something a little bit later uh, in the blurb about why you should visit Lake Wakabuck Hotel. Uh, but here uh, we have a pretty good bird's eye view of all of the exciting places in the Three Lakes, Three Lakes area. Um, now, we can't think of Wakabuck proper, the western side of the lake, without talking or thinking about the Mead family. The um, generator, or the, the, the first Meads to arrive to settle on Mead Street were Enoch and Jemima. On their honeymoon, they supposedly came by horse from Greenwich, Connecticut, and decided to settle in um, that western part of, of town. It hadn't, wasn't Mead Street yet, but uh, there were Mead uh, settlers who had come here before, before Enoch and Jemima. One was Solomon Mead, who was the great uncle of Enoch Mead, and he was the first pastor of the Presbyterian Church, and he had come to town in 1752. Uh, well, Enoch and Jemima settled into uh, into Wakabuck, built a house in 1770 called Elmdon, which we'll see pretty soon. But they had eight children, and the one child we're going to concentrate on is Alfred. Alfred looks kind of like a lady here, but certainly wasn't. <clears throat> and we'll hear about Alfred uh, with one of the other houses. But there was the beginning of the Mead dynasty in Wakabuck. This is a picture taken in 1935, uh, again, from the, um, the Wakabuck uh, Country Club booklet. And this is the gather a gathering of the Mead family. I and mean, the only person I'm really gonna point out is this little girl here, who is Susan Henry. Susan Henry still is the uh, uh, last Mead I know of who is, who is still living on Mead Street full time. And this is Susan in 1935, like a really cute little toddler. 
here is where our tour starts. We're going to start our tour at the Mead Cemetery. Then we're going to visit um, the Alfred Mead House right here. That's uh, actually where Susan and James Henry uh, now live. This we'll go to see, we'll see Elmdon. We'll see um, the Martin R. Mead House, which was sold to Robert Ho, which eventually becomes the Wakabuck Country Club. We'll talk about Wakabuck Post Office. We'll see Albert Mead's house. Earl Smith is Susan Henry's father. And we don't really talk about um, his property or his farm, but I do, he did have a farm that uh, until the 1960s, he actually was uh, delivering milk to his neighbors. He had a dairy farm, small dairy farm, and a small orchard, a few other animals and eggs. And I remember Susan telling me at one time that she used to go with his father in his truck making milk deliveries. And then we are going to talk about um, this house Lakeview a little bit and Terry a bit, the Wakabuck Hotel, Mead Memorial Chapel. And we're not gonna talk about it here, but I always think it's um, quite interesting that at the end, this is Chapel Road and um, Actually, I think Jared, I think this is the house with the two front doors, which is being worked on in the recent past. Lebius Mead's house became the town farm. The town farm was the poor house and it's way at the end of, uh, of Chapel Road down almost to 138. And there are lots of references to that in to the town farm, the, the northern part of the uh, town farm. Our town had two town farms which is where the indigent and the poor people were sent. All right, Mead Street. The um, opening, the beginning of Mead Street is the Mead, the Mead Cemetery, which basically is a private cemetery and the graves belong to members of the Mead family, their relatives and um, a few other people. I think the Ad there are some Adams family buried in this too, but they all belong to the Mead community. It is a beautiful, beautiful cemetery. And actually I just took this the other day and the magnolia tree is beginning to bloom. Here we have Elm Don. Uh, this, this picture was taken in the 1880s, but the house was built in 1770 by Enoch and Jemima and their eight children and their three slaves. Uh, I talked about uh, uh, Enoch's slaves when I did the program on slavery a little earlier this year for the library, which you can get on the library's website or YouTube. This is Elm Dunn today. Uh, it sits with the gable end toward the road. It's a really beautiful, beautiful house dating back to the 1770s. But a little further up the street, and this is the home, the current home of Susan and Jim Henry. It is called the Homestead. It was built in 1820 and it was built by Alfred Mead and his wife, Polly, who had, um, who had not quite as many children as the, some of the other Mead family, but one of their children, George Washington Mead, we will hear about. Uh, a little later, but this was um, this was called the homestead, and it was built in 1820 by Alfred and Polly. Polly was a Quaker, by the way, and apparently lived a very simple life. I mean, dressed very simply in the Quaker man man manner. Um, that brings me to occasionally I get questions about the um, Underground Railroad being in our town, I've never heard of it being associated with, with this house, with the homestead, but being that Polly was a Quaker, and if you've ever been in the basement of this house, it's conducive to, uh, to um, hiding people who are escaping from, from slave, slavery. Uh, the Henrys keep it as kind of a little uh, family museum, but it, it's very evocative of what it, life might have been like in the 1800s. Now we're going up the street a little bit. We're coming to uh, what will eventually be the Wakabuck Country Club. But at this point, it was the home of 
Robert, Robert Ho, who bought it from Mead in um, about the in the 1870s, and he added a lot to it. He uh, built he built the Wakabuck Post Office around 1879, um, I believe it was. Uh, he also built several other. He built a boathouse. He built several playhouses for uh, for his children. And in 1909, he opened it um, as an as an inn. Or in, during during his tenure, he opened it as an inn, basically for he was a Mead relative. Basically, it was for Mead relatives and their guests. Um, as you are driving by on Mead Street in front of this building, now this, this is the side, this is um, slightly, it's arranged. Building hasn't changed, but the, uh, the traffic pattern has slightly. And the front of this building, and which is now the country club, there's a stone wall and in the stone wall is one of those markers that tells you it's a post road marker for the Vermont post road and it tells you how many miles you are from New York City, which is 52. All right, this is the boathouse that Robert Ho III built for um, the pleasure of his guests and for his family. Robert Ho was um, and his older brother Richard were the inventors of the circular printing press, which made the family's fortune. And uh, Robert Ho indeed made good use of that fortune in buying up a lot of land in Wakabuck. Here's another picture of the boathouse with another building attached, which originally was called um, the Roost. And it was for the, the Mead women to gather and gossip and sew and do whatever women do. Eventually it was, um, I believe it was on the other side of the lake that was brought across and it was attached and is still still there as part. This is now the Wakabuck Country Club Boathouse. And this, this is a uh, part of that facility and beach. Um, when we did, I did a um, farmer program uh, last year before the pandemic started. Uh, where we had a lot of farm uh, farm tools and implements and uh, people brought stuff to show. And this interesting piece of equipment, which says our Ho, Golden's Bridge, New York. Now our Ho, I'm sure is our friend, Robert Ho III. Uh, and this apparently was used to transport a liquid, probably cider, uh, by train into New York City. There's a little, this is a little um, gadget, a little cover that will go over here. I opened it so that when I took the picture, so you could see that there's a huge bottle inside. And uh, we think it was probably cider that was transported this way. This, this was found, now remember, Robert Ho was the turn of the 20th century. So uh, whether it was, cider, hard cider, who knows, but um, this was found in the attic of Old Golden Bridge train station by a gentleman named uh, Ken Catone, who lives on old, in Old Golden Bridge on um, Old Bedford Road. And as, uh, I don't know whether he was a teenager or a young man, anyway, he was, he was um, rooting through the abandoned train station and came across this and he has loaned it to the town so that we can display it. It's in my office right now sitting in the fireplace. Uh, very interesting and the fact that uh, something that was found in Golden's Bridge had a very close um, relationship to, to Wakabuck. In fact, uh, most of the travelers who came to Wakabuck to stay in the hotels and so on came by train to Golden's Bridge and then either took a stage, a carriage, or uh, walked about five miles down 138 into, into Wakabuck. Um, here's a quick picture of the post office, Wakabuck post office in 1889 with John Ford, the mailman, and his two horse powered mail cart. He would bring the mail from Katona um, into, into Wakabuck and then probably go on to South Salem. and. Uh, Arts East. 
here it is about 30 years later. I think this looks like um, the same, same post office, but different conveyances, different, um, different automobiles and different way of traveling. Love the sporty get up on that gentleman outside his, um, his, his station wagon. Well, several years ago, or quite whenever the Wakabuck Post Office was last um, uh, updated, someone, uh, and I cannot remember the woman's name, and I feel so embarrassed, but I know she's the sister-in-law of Elizabeth Head. And uh, anyway, she contacted me and said, would you like the mail delivery window from the Wakabuck Post Office? And why should I turn down a, a question like that? So uh, this, this is now sitting in my, in my second workroom of my office. And uh, whoops, it has a wonderful plaque up here, US Postal Service, but no date, unfortunately. But here was the window she also gave me. She had the, the canceling, the stamp, can, the envelope canceling machine and a few other uh, great items that I uh, went in the back behind are all the, uh, the cubbies where the mail would have been sorted. So behind here are all the cubbies for when the postmistress or postmaster would sort the mail. Now we're going back to Mead Street. We've gone past the post office. We've gone past the uh, uh, post office road, which heads back towards South Salem. This is the driveway actually into the Albert Mead house, which was built in the latter half of the 1800s. Italianate a Victorian house. Quite handsome and Albert Mead owned a lot, a lot of property in Wakabuck. Whoops, we'll go. We'll continue further north. This is the Lakeview Cottage. And um, the Lakeview Cottage was built by uh, George Washington Mead, who was Alfred and Polly Mead's son, the people who owned the homestead. He is the grandson, uh, George Washington Mead was the grandson of uh, Enoch Mead. And they, uh, George Washington and his wife lived in this house first, but they kept having a lot of children. And in fact, the house kind of had a nickname of called the incubator. And by the time they were finished having children, and this house was built around in the 1830s, I believe, 1850s. By the time um, all 11 children had arrived, um, it was decided they needed a bigger house. So they built this house and this house is called Tarriabit and it's on Tarriabit Road, which is as we're going north on Mead Street, it's, we're getting a little, we're getting closer to the lake where you can see the lake and we're getting closer to the Mead, the Mead Chapel. This is on the Eastern side of the road. You really can't see the house because it's down a very, a very long driveway, but it was built, um, that Lakeview was built around 1860. I just found my note. And Tarriabit was built in 1895 and it was, built by George Washington Mead and his wife, Sarah Studwell Mead. And they, in this house, um, there was a room, a bedroom for, for everybody, not like the cramped quarters they had in the, la the Lakeview cottage. Now the Mead, the Mead Chapel, which everybody loves to um, drive past and think about and what is it like inside and, how beautiful it is. It was built in um, 1905 to 19, in 1907, it was dedicated. The architect was Hobart, up, excuse me, Hobart Upjohn and it's the English Gothic style. It was built by Sarah, Sarah Studwell Mead uh, to honor her husband and all of his family going back to all of, all of the Mead family. First minute, sisters. There, it was a family family chapel, um, only open mainly in the summertime and for Christmas services, and it was basically attended to by pastors uh, and uh, ministers coming from the Union Theological Seminary. 
for for quite a few years it also in more recent times uh, St. Mary's Church in Katona would have Sunday services here. And uh, now basically um, there have been wonderful concerts and art shows and, and events, um, events like that. Um, and maybe before I leave the chapel, before the chapel was here, there was a barn on this property and the barn was moved. Um, to build the chapel, I guess. The chapel, by the way, was built of all area, mostly area field stone and area timbers. <coughs> but the barn, let's talk about the barn a minute because the barn purportedly, and here comes the legend, uh, North Salem, as we probably know, or you've heard, North Salem was one of the homes they claimed to be the home of the American circus. There are a couple of other towns that claim that honor too, but. Homer's had a lot to do with the Bailey Circus way back when they were just animal animal shows. And the Baileys, <laughs> Hekaliah Bailey, had imported African animals, but and he in the summertime he would travel throughout the Northeast and down to the southern part of uh, of uh, the United States with his animal menagerie. But in the winter, he needed a place to store his animals. And one of the places apparently was the barn that predated this chapel. During one of those winters, this is how the story goes, the elephant in his barn died. What do you do with a dead elephant in the middle of January? Well, you think about it a lot. You can't really dig a hole and bury it. so. Since the barn was not very far away from Lake Wakabuck, what you can do is get your oxen team and drag the elephant, the beast, out onto the lake and let it sit there because uh, sooner or later, uh, the wild animals might tend to parts of this beast, but pretty soon uh, spring will come, the lake will melt, the elephant will sink to the bottom of the lake. Takes care of the elephant and uh, takes care of any cleanup you might have. Remember the lake is about uh, uh, 50, 60 feet deep. So uh, uh, good place to hide an elephant. And it's been a lake since glacier time, 20,000 years ago. So there's a lot of muck at the bottom of the lake. People have been trying to find this elephant's bones for a couple of hundred years or at least 150 years, and nobody has found any elephant bones bones yet. So whether that elephant really did get dragged on the ice and sink through, we don't know, but nobody has found the bones. But it's a great story, and it makes some sense, for sure. Um, Robert Ho of uh, the third, who, who uh, bought and started the, the Wakabuck Inn, and, and then which, uh, eventually became the country club, built the post office. He also did not like Wakabuck School, the one room schoolhouse being on Mead Street. And so he decided to move it onto what is now Schoolhouse Road. And uh, I believe this is the second iteration of that school. Anyway, it is the Wakabuck Schoolhouse, um, probably on its, uh, the location it, it served until from the 1880s until 1941. Now we come to the seasons of, or the, the, uh, the second half of the 19th century when Wakabuck and Golden's Bridge and Cross River became summertime destinations to escape the horrors of New York City. And the Harlem Railroad really promoted people coming up the New York Central Line or the Harlem Line at that point and spending two weeks in the country. And this is the, the um, front of a brochure that introduced the 1889 season. And the Hotel Walkabuck was, uh, was uh, advertised in this booklet. And let me just read you. Uh, a little bit about the Hotel Wakabuck, which was not the inn, the Wakabuck Inn, which became the country club. We're not talking about that now. We are going to talk about a different building, which was right at the western edge of Lake Wakabuck, which you'll see in a minute. But 
situated on a mountain, thousand feet above the level of the sea. Well, it wasn't quite that high because the highest mountain was in Mount is uh, a little bit east of there, and that was at 982 feet, but probably more like seven or 800 feet. It's comfortable, substantial structure structure enjoys a select family patronage will accommodate a hundred guests broad piazzas on three sides overlooking the lakes and well shaded grounds going into the whoops whoops, whoops i go back uh, mountain air exceptionally pure dry invigorating health giving and free from malarias and mosquitoes and lots of refreshing breezes for out-of-town guests this was the broad side advertising the Lake Wakabuck House. Um, Martin R. Mead, proprietor. Now he ran the, the uh, house from the, uh, the 1860s until 1882 when he died. And then his wife ran it and ran the hotel until uh, 1896 when it burned down. But look at what you could do. Boating, fishing, bathing, bowling, driving, rambling. No tramps, no bar, no malaria and 50 miles from Grand Central Station. And here we are. That's the hotel at Lake Wakabuck. And here we are at the end of Lake Wakabuck looking toward the uh, western Lake Wakabuck Mountain and the hills of, of uh, Richfield. And here is Mead Street. This is a more close up drawing of the uh, hotel with the veranda one of the verandas that said they had three sides of verandas. And here are some folks, at least uh, uh, an etching of some folks getting ready to go on one of their rambles. And they looks like they were gonna take a one horse shay, one horse cart to do one of their rambles. I hope they all weren't planning to climb aboard. Now, just that segue back to uh, that inn at Wakabuck, which became the Wakabuck, Lake Wakabuck Inn and Country Club, which started uh, around 1912. There's somebody using the porta cachet uh, and sign from the Touring Club of America. About 1912, as I said, it, it kind of segued into an inn and because uh, from an inn to a country club because uh, why not make a little money from this deal? And it had been sold by Robert Ho back to members of the Mead family into a, uh, into a uh, corporation. And they developed a uh, first a nine hole golf course, which then became an 18 hole golf course. This is, the, this is probably from the 1920s or 30s. And they hired this gentleman here, Jock Dullen, to be from Scotland, who was a, a major uh, um, golfsman, uh, golf club developer, and an excellent golf champion, who came to uh, the Wakaba Country Club. From uh, he was he had come to America and first served in several other country clubs, worked in several other country clubs, but was. Um, was asked by one of the members of the Wakabuck area to uh, come see what we can offer you. And he stayed for 30, 30 years. Uh, his brother, uh, I think it was George uh, Ellen, I may have that name wrong, came to, uh, to also do um, maintenance and to develop the second back nine, the back nine of the country club of course, and uh, from him we have our, uh, I believe, Jock's brother. Jock is the uncle of Waldy Gullen, who many of you probably know through Lions and Fire, Firehouse, and just uh, uh, Waldy in his 90s is our direct link to the history of everything that's happened in the 20th century and the 21st. Ah, so where was Marilyn Monroe really married? Um, this is the 16th green and Marilyn Monroe was met. Well, she was married in, uh, in, I uh, believe in a civil ceremony, in a civil ceremony in, uh, either White Plains or New York city. She then had a, uh, a reception and 
not a um, um, formal marriage with a minister on, or with, um, with, with the help of clergy on the 16th, 16th green of the uh, of Wakabuck Country Club and then retired to her, her um, agent or lawyer's house just off, off, the, off the green to have the celebration. She did get her, um, she and Arthur Miller got their, uh, their uh, wedding, got, the, got their marriage um, license at the home of Cyrus Russell in Cross River prior to the marriage. All right, also when we talk about Wakabuck and the, uh, the needs, we have to talk about railroads. And from the, after the Civil War until the panics of the 1870s, everybody wanted to build a railroad. And there were several members of the, of the Meade family uh, and the Hunt family who were the uh, principals in the New York, Housatonic and Northern Railroad. This is a uh, copy, this is the inside pages of that, um, of that brochure that you just saw the, the front of. Now the railroad that they were involved in, the New York uh, Housatonic um, and Northern Railroad would come up the Harlem line, follow the Harlem line. Uh, this is where the New Haven would branch off, but this line was supposed to continue up here. And obviously it did continue here, but they were going to do a branch called the New York Housatonic and Northern, which would come right through Lewisboro area, the Western part of Lewisboro, would go up, I believe if we followed Holly Mountain Road up to Mountain Lakes Park, it would just, it would follow right there. Uh, seems to me it would go right through the Wakabuck area and go all the way up to, to connect to Brookfield and the Danbury area. Uh, Probably the, the farmers were looking forward to it because it was a way of getting milk to town and the hotel owners were happy because it would get customers up to their, up to their hotel area. However, uh, panics in the 1870s set in and uh, nothing was ever developed. And I think we should we'd really be happy for that because uh, in previous hamlets we visited, there was going to be railroads coming through um, this uh, Lewisboro Hamlet, there was one scheduled to come through Cross River, and now this one would have gone through Wakabuck. So we would have been the uh, Chicago hub or the uh, Kansas City hub of all the railroads in Westchester County. Okay, now we're going to look, take just an overlook of the lakes. Here we are looking from, uh, I think it's a place called Sunset Point. It's not Lookout Point because from Lookout Point, you cannot see all three lakes. But here you can see Wakabuck, uh, Ripawam, and which would come down in here, and Oscalita. And this is before anything was developed. This is probably from about 1900, 1907. Here's another uh, look, and I believe this one was from where a Ridgefield Academy is now in Ridgefield. So if you go over uh, Holly Mountain Road, uh, not Holly Mountain Road, follow Main Street into Ridgefield over West Mountain Road, you will go past what used to be a uh, uh, Notre Dame, Notre Dame uh, uh, nuns, nuns retirement home to now Ridgefield Academy. And looking out their back door, you would have looked down back towards South Salem and back toward the lakes. Uh, here is a view from the, it says 500 feet above the lake. And this is from what is now Lookout Point. This picture was taken uh, again before any development had happened uh, in the Lake Wakabuck area on the, the Eastern side of Lake Wakabuck area. And this is probably, again, I'm thinking the 1930s, maybe, or a little earlier. And here's a picture I took uh, about 2000, well, yeah, 2018 or later, the same view of Lake Wakabuck, looking toward the Western, the Western Hill. And obviously it was winter because there's a little snow on the ground. Here's one of my favorite pictures in all of the collection of pictures I have. Don't know who it is, what she's doing, but this is Oscalita Road. This is going 
probably towards South Salem. I'm really not sure which direction it is, but Oscalita Road leads from South Salem over the hill past Mountain Lakes Camp into North Salem. And I just, I use this lady in my ghost, my ghost talks and she's just so evocative of um, winter and whether it's serenity or not, I don't know. But this is an awesome bridge and we'll see it again <clears throat> right here. With, uh, it was a favorite hangout of during the Victorian era when there were several camps, uh, summer camps built or, or um, that people would come up when they didn't want to stay in a hotel, they would stay in a more rustic situation. One of those was Camp Clover, which is the, we'll see a picture of that pretty soon, which the house is now Ted and Free, uh, Fred and Tina Cole's house. And there was another camp called Camp Nemo, which was written about in a, an 1890s newspaper, which I was going to read a little bit about. But um, anyway, this is, people would come and uh, they went to entertain themselves. They would come and, and, and stroll around the, the hillsides. Another picture of where that woman was on the bridge, this uh, canoe, there's a culvert. And you can go under the bridge, you can canoe. Well, these guys are in a rowboat, but they're going under, under the bridge. They're going from Oscalita toward uh, Lake Wakaba. The, this culvert or this, this channel was built to uh, help with the water system in New York City. And uh, it goes from Ripalom to Oscalita. There's one channel from Ripalom to Oscalita and then this channel from Oscalita into Lake uh, Wakabuck. Here's a picture I took a couple of years ago about what the uh, channel looks like today. You can still, I think, get a very low draft, shallow draft canoe through here. Uh, I know when we lived in Lake Wakabuck, it was so much fun to uh, take your canoe through the channel. And, uh, uh, if you were under the, under the bridge when a car went by, it was a little scary, but <clears throat> lots of fun. Yeah, I had something I was going to read about Camp Nemo, but I don't know what I did with it. So, oh, I know I didn't put it on a big piece of paper. I put it on a small piece of paper. Anyway, we'll continue. This is the Coles house nowadays. It does not quite look like that. Still a salt box. You can still see the shape, but this was known as Camp Comfort. And while we're looking at this, I'm going to read you, even though Camp Nemo uh, was happening at the same time that Camp Comfort was, and those people on the lake were on the bridge were probably from Camp Comfort. <clears throat> Camp Nemo, I believe, was just up the street a little bit. And um, in 1890, in this little this little piece of piece I got from the, a paper, a newspaper of that era, said uh, everything was very very organized. There was a black cook who came from a caterer who came from Danbury who stayed the two weeks that the camp the people would rent the camp. And breakfast was at seven. Uh, they dined at one for lunch. They supped at seven again in the evening and uh, everything was local produce and from the local farm, the party farm, they had Jersey cows provide lots of milk golden in color. <clears throat> and in 12 days, <clears throat> excuse me, of being at the camp, 220 quarts of milk were, uh, were drunk. But you had to be careful. You had even though you had a chaperone because these were all uh, vacationers from the city, very happy to be in the country, but they brought along Aunt Mary Pearson from Brooklyn as their chaperone. And she made sure that things happened with propriety. Now, just a few scenes about, uh, about the lakes. This is Lake Wakabuck. Uh, I believe this looks to me like uh, the point at the end of Cove Road. There's another, there's a pretty little cove in here. Uh, it was great for canoeing, for fishing. Um, and this is Wakabuck. This is Eastern Wakabuck Mountain. Here is a picture postcard from about 1907 of Lake Ripawam, 
the uh, caption says Rifawa. So uh, uh, copy editing didn't quite get that, but this is looking toward, uh, toward Ridgefield. Here are two ladies, Theodosia Pardee and, uh, and Laura Benedict Knapp, who are out for an excursion on Lake Wakabuck back in the uh, way about 1900. Theodosia Pardee, yeah, 1910 in Lake Wakabuck. Here we have Castle Rock, which uh, is probably the best known feature on the northern northwestern or north central side of lake the lake it's about 60 feet high and it's a, i'm sure there are some people watching who have uh, who have ch challenged that rock and have have, have uh, spent lots of time diving off the rock diving off the rock nobody has ever gotten deep enough to find the elephant though also ice in the winter collecting ice for use in the hotels, for use in uh, just people's houses was a, had to be done. And it was done on, uh, these, these pictures were from the uh, country club booklet, but uh, ice was harvested all over the lake for use on boat, uh, by everybody who happened to have farms and houses around there. Again, here are some gentlemen out fishing. This kind of looks, it reminds me of Perch, the Perch Bay area, but I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't canoed around Lake Wakabux in many years. We lived there in the late 1960s. Ah, the Indian ovens. Were they really Indian ovens? Were they used by the Indians? Or is it just a really unique glacial feature left when the glaciers retreated about 10 to 15,000 years ago? Um, Great, awesome to uh, canoe out there. And uh, if you're brave enough, get up on the rocks and look in the ovens. Now, here is, um, remember way, way, way back, I said this was where the swinging bridge was. Well, the uh, gen gentleman named Jonathan Bulkley owned a lot of property at the Eastern end of Lake Ripawam. And in 1910, he built a swinging bridge. Whoops. Uh, and the swinging bridge went from a cliff on his property, uh, 60, about 60 feet across uh, an expanse at the end of the lake out to a tulip tree. And it was built, engineered so that it could swing back and forth. It was a favorite of, of hikers, of, uh, of uh, probably people from those camps, those, uh, those rustic camps. Anyway, it was definitely a destination point for more than just visitors to the Bulkley property. But by the 1950s, it was beginning to deteriorate and it was taken, taken down. There may be some old folks looking who actually went uh, and spent some time on the, on the swinging bridge. These are two, two twin houses on Lake Oscalita, which probably date back to the early 1900s. Uh, Lake Oscalita started to be um, built on, especially on the south side, which is where these are. A safe south side of Lake Oscalita uh, had the first, the first, uh, you can't, uh, the first settlement. And uh, uh, it's still more rustic houses over there. Uh, and there are, it's, it's on the Knapp Road side nowadays. And it, it does have a number of homes, but they are all fairly rustic. Um, here is some that, that had quite a lot of, I don't know, notoriety, but it was well known all over Westchester County. It was owned by Merwin Dickens. It was a boat house. He, set, he rented boats to fishermen and just pleasure boaters from this shack with this, um, this structure, which was right on the, um, the end of the, the Wakabuck end of the channel right on where Lake Wakabuck and the channel then went out this way to go into Lake Oscalita. And he rented uh, boats to fishermen. Here's another view of it, a little bit easier to see what it's, what it's all about. Um, he used this until about 1927 when it was just becoming too much of an eyesore and he, uh, he built another place 
right on like Lake Wakabuck. Here is David Dickens. I'm not sure who, which, how he belongs to Merwin. He might be a brother and two fishermen. Great picture of these guys having an afternoon. The picture is circa 1927. And here is Dickens' new boathouse. It was, um, it had living space up above and this is from about 1930. This was the Dickens Boathouse I knew when we first moved to Lake Wakabuck on Lakeview Road in 1966. And here's a side view. And it had a canteen. And this picture comes from the South Salem Fire Department scrapbook. So whether these are firemen having a party here or just a normal day, of people enjoying themselves. And uh, Dickon, Murrow and Dickens was a fireman, so I'm sure firemen were always welcome there. Across the street, um, now that, uh, that Dickens Boathouse uh, fronted or backed up onto Cove Road, which is one of the three roads into the Lake Wakabuck Association area. And uh, on Cove Road, there was Gulf, a Gulf station, another Gulf sign, which our town seems to have a couple of. Gulf really had the, uh, the, uh, the people's attention here in South Salem. Um, and basically, I think the, the, boat, the, the, the uh, gas was needed for the boats on the lake because they allowed motorboats back then and maybe for the uh, occasional car. Murrow uh, Dickens also, had this log cabin. This is uh, circa 1920s. And here's a little better picture of that log cabin, which I believe <clears throat> is Dan, our, our town councilman, Dan Welsh's house now. This is a long time ago, but I believe, I'm pretty sure it's where Dan lives nowadays on Cove Road. Um, now, before we get into this, this is a picture from the south side of Lake Wakaba, the, the South, south Shore Association. And um, I'm going to give you a little tour of outhouses, but while we're looking at this picture of, uh, of this outhouse <clears throat> that I call at the end of a garden path, I wanna read you a little bit from a book that um, a man named Jesse Pollard wrote when he was in his seventies, looking back at his time on the south side, the south shore of Lake Wakabuck, started to be built up in the early 20s. It was all farmland that belonged to the Benedict Knapp family. And Mary Knapp was the last of the, of the Benedict Knapps. And she would rent out camp space, for people to put a tent or a small uh, camp on her property and she, uh, the, the property that these camp these camps there are now about 30 of these houses in there which are still rather rustic and people do not own their property they own their houses but they still rent the property under their house well Jesse Pollard's family was one of the early early builders his house is now owned by Elaine Velacos, much, much improved from uh, when the Pollards lived there in the 20s when it had the, needed the use of one of these outhouses. Um, and Jesse says, the passion for Wakabak burned so warmly in my father's heart that he and a friend, Uncle Frank Benedict, canvassed all the owners of property around the three lakes with an eye to buying some land for a summer cottage, which we always called camps. Absolutely no one would sell a square inch. At length, however, Mrs. Mary Benedict, grandmother of Mary Knapp, began to rent spaces in her cow pasture bordering on Lake Wakabuck to friends who wanted to erect simple structures or even tent platforms in order to enjoy a comparatively simple outdoor life in the country. People in those days were only too much aware of uh, the ravages of tuberculosis, which seemed to be relieved or possibly even prevented by exposure to good clean air. People of modest means, like my school teacher father, were eager to, to get their families out of the city, at least for the summer. 
My mother and father came to the lake as early colonists of what has ultimately become the South Shore Wakabuck Association. Mary Benedict accepted them as campers and assigned them a spot to build their cottage. The original building was done in 1913 or 1914. And here we have one of the outhouses. Elaine Velakos gave me a wonderful tour about five years ago of these outhouses. A couple may still be used as outhouses, but most of them have been assigned different purposes. This one is now a garden shed. I love this one because the curtains, it's very a very cozy looking, uh, welcoming outhouse if there is such a thing. This one, is still used as a party, uh, uh, a party outhouse, not used normally, but whenever there's a party on, uh, on the premises, this is a good place to uh, do what you have to do. And I included this one because I love, you can't have an outhouse without a half moon and not too many of those outhouses did, but this one did, so I love it. Now, we're going to go from the south side of Lake Wakabuck over crossing Oscalita Road and go into Twin Lakes. And Twin Lakes has, was developed, um, the property that became the Twin Lakes Village was, was bought from H.B. Uh, Anderson, who we'll hear about when we get up to Mountain Lakes, but uh, she bought 106, in 1906, in 1906, a woman bought property from H.B. Uh, Anderson and sold it to the um, development, the, the Peninsula Development Corporation, who wanted to, do, who to develop the peninsula between the two lakes, Oscalina and Ripawam. So in 1949, they set up um, this corporation to sell to sell property, and and <coughs> uh, it was based, I think, in White Plains. And uh, the first people to uh, come upon this this land and decide to buy were Fern and Charles Bendel, and they bought property. The first people to buy property in 1949 build their house over the next few years. Their daughter, Sharon, Shannon Robinette, which many of us know, especially if we were involved with the library, Shannon who passed away at much too young an age, anyway, uh, was their daughter. And she also lived on Lake Walk, on uh, in the Twin Lakes. And uh, um, they were, her, her parent, her father, in fact, uh, I think was our building inspector for a while. But, um, that purchased was, well, that way we're gonna get into that. And that's what uh, I will, I got a little, bit, a little bit ahead of, ahead of myself. What I wanted to, uh, what I love about these um, brochures is there's Lake Oscalita and Ripawam and the, the area in between, which became Twin Lakes Village. And here's Wakabuck Lake, which, um, doesn't look to be twice the size of these, but it's always good to make your lake look the biggest. Um, this was something in 1973, the Union Carbide Corporation was developing a, a way of hopefully aerating lakes that were becoming um, eutrophied. And this would, this piece of equipment was lowered by helicopter into, there were two of them submerged in Lake Wakabuck as an aerator, the had air uh, a pump pumping station was set up at the uh, end of the lake in on the Wakabuck Mead Street side to pump air to these aerators located at the bottom of the lake. And from seven, 1973 to 2004, they did operate. Uh, they were not that efficient, and it was very costly to operate. So it didn't take too long. Well, it took that time from 73 to 2004 when uh, it was decided to give up, give up that idea. Uh, now, this is just one of my ghost stories. This, this is on the south side of Lake Oscalita. 
<clears throat> this was a, actually, it's one of the most sad, one of the sadder ghost stories that I tell. I call this the Wailing Woods. This is actually what it looks like when you uh, uh, have your, there's a house down here where the, uh, probably where the tragedy happened. Anyway, in about 1937, there was a drowning, a little boy and his, um, his mother drowned on, on the lake, on Lake Oscalita. And uh, uh, it turned out to be a more dastardly story than that. But when the father had been out on the lake fishing and when he returned, there was no sight of his son or his wife. And um, uh, they could not find the bodies. They searched and searched, could not find the bodies. Trans uh, transfer ourselves to more modern times. And people who live in this area on a day that um, is conducive to, it usually happens on a, like a November day where there's been a very warm day and there's kind of an inversion of air. Uh, they can hear people down on this part of the lake can hear a wailing. And it's kind of like a train approaching, the wailing gets louder and louder and then fades away. And it's supposedly the crying, the wailing of um, this father searching for, for his son. Not too long ago, much more recently, probably about two, two years ago, I got a phone call from somebody who'd, who had heard about the ghost story that I told. And she said, um, there's something a little more sinister there. He said apparently then this, this was an incident that had occurred, uh, this drowning in the family involved her grandmother and uh, her husband. And apparently the husband really was in the middle of a love affair with somebody and he needed a way to get rid of his family. And uh, supposedly the drowning was a little more dastardly than than the, the newspaper article indicated. Uh, we did take, um, in any case, there, there, is, there is a wailing that can be heard at certain times. And there is another ghost um, that appears knocking at, uh, at a couple of doors in this area. I don't wanna go into the whole story, but definitely there is some ghostly activity around the Three Lakes area, this, this being one of them. So whether that was a murder of a wife and child to make the way clear for a second marriage, or was it a drowning while the father was out fishing? Um, we don't know. We're going to go continue on Oscalita Road now. We're going almost to where the road turns into Old Pond Road goes, goes right. This is the beginning of Old Pond Road. This is the party homestead. And uh, uh, supposedly when they were building this house way, way back in the late or middle 1800s, the builders discovered Indian skeletons on the property as they were digging to make way for the, for the basement of this house. Um, so they, they excavated the bones, they sent them to the uh, American Museum of Natural History where supposedly they were declared authentic uh, and kept in the basement at the museum where they supposedly still are. When I heard about that story, I did contact the museum about it, if they had any records on this, but I never, never received an answer. So whether there were Indians buried uh, under the, uh, the foundation of this house, perhaps there were. There was a lot of Indian activity around, around the lakes area, but this house is also the scene of another Another ghost story of a woman who has appeared to uh, the family. Again, she's weeping, she's crying. And uh, the gentleman who told me the story talks about as a, a, a young child, as eight or nine year old, waking up at night and seeing a woman in a white uh, 1800s kind of uh, nightgown searching around the room, uh, going near his sister, they slept in the same room and there was a doll's cradle in the room and this woman was hunched over the, the doll's cradle looking at the dolls, apparently um, uh, looking for a lost child. And that ghost had appeared several times and this house 
has been known to hear a woman, a woman sobbing. Um, the house is there, it's right on the corner where Old Pond, uh, Oscar Leader, uh, goes up the hill and Old Pond goes around the hill. But this is the, this is the party house. It was a, a huge farm. The parties owned a lot of property. Apparently going up, this is the Wakabuck Mountain Hillside. And um, I just want to read, this is another little ghost story and then we'll leave the ghost stories. Um, Kathy Corey, our town clerk, many years ago, received a letter from a woman from Pennsylvania and said that her father had been, had been involved in this little ghostly happening. And her father, her father said, I had a little shack on the shore of Lake Wakabuck, one of three connecting lakes. It was about eight o'clock. The sun had sunk below the horizon and the stillness was everywhere except for the droning of the beetles and an occasional drum of the bullfrogs. And half an hour later, it was dark. The sky was clear, except here and there, an occasional cloud would obscure, obscure the ribbon of moon for an instant. The cabin stood on the slope of a hill in a grove of trees, and one got a creepy feeling from the loneliness of the place. After undressing, I pushed a chair alongside my bed, placed a lamp on it, and jumped in, intending to put myself to sleep with the sign of the floor by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I had just reached the part where the little red man of the Andaman Islands puts his blowpipe to his lips and is about to blow the poison dart when I heard a weird step alongside my bed. It seemed as though it were a tread on wood. I stopped reading. All was quiet. Not a sound anywhere. I wondered whether my imagination had not played tricks on me when I heard another tread dull and rolling right in back of me and somewhere between my head and the roof. I could not read any more. So he, at that point, decided to take his shotgun, find his canoe, row across the lake, and find safety somewhere on the other side of the lake. Um, spent somewhere in a bean wagon, according to his write-up. Nobody knows where he could have found a bean wagon in 1926 uh, on Oscalita Road, but anyway, Five o'clock in the morning arrived and he stopped by the farmhouse, which I'm assuming is probably this party farmhouse and told the farmer about what had happened. And the farmer started laughing hysterically and said, well, I had some girls camping there, uh, oh, uh, about a year ago. And the same thing, they came running to me, screaming, screaming about hearing this, this horrible clatter on the roof. And he said, you have to realize that that cabin is under trees, which are used to be, it used to be an apple orchard. And those are just apples falling off the trees, rolling across the roof. I would accept that, except for in his write-up, his very poetic write-up, he talks about listening to the bullfrogs <clears throat> and hearing the sound of the beetles humming. And if that's the case, the apples weren't falling off the trees yet because it sounds to me like it was um, kind of still in the summertime and maybe the apples hadn't fallen off the trees yet. So was it a ghost or was it apples going off the trees? All right, now this is the road up to Mountain Lakes Camp. Uh, right on this corner was the former home of the Grumman family and Mr. Grumman was a shoemaker. Uh, it was just a small house and in the 1800s, <clears throat> he applied his trade making shoes. Uh, but the last person to live in the Grumman home on that corner before you go up the hill was Rachel Grumman. And uh, I talked about her in one of my other talks. I don't remember which one now. But anyway, Rachel apparently was stood up on her wedding day and retreated to the house never to leave again and lived as a recluse and a hermit for the rest of her life as the, as the house fell down around her. And apparently her first car ride was taken about 1927 uh, when she became ill and a neighbor took her to the hospital where she died. And that was the end of Miss Rachel. And the house eventually just fell into disrepair. If you look carefully before the weeds and the, and the, and the shrubs grow up, uh, just before you go up the hill, you can still see the foundation uh, right next to a, a yellow, a fairly new yellow house.
This picture is, we are now at Mountain Lakes Park, which was formerly known as Mountain Lakes Camp. And it has quite, quite a history. And I've got to find my piece of paper, which tells me that history. And I don't know where I put that. Oh, okay. Um, this is how it looks in 2021. This happens to be my faithful dog captain who has to bring a stick home on every, on, on every hike we take. But um, this originally the property all belonged to a man named H.B. Uh, Anderson who came to the area around uh, the late 18, 1890s to build the water the water system for Ridgefield, Connecticut. And he brought with him, um, he hired, he didn't bring with him, he hired Italian laborers to come and do all the, uh, uh, the stonework for the, for the Ridgefield water supply. And after that, he wanted to divide to, uh, he had over 900 acres and he wanted to make it into a resort homes, um, a resort home community. And which never actually transpired. And he only ended up building his own house in 1900 overlooking the lake at what is now Lookout Point. But he also managed to build something called the Port of Missing Men, which uh, had a much better, a much better history. And uh, it was a restaurant where we will see a picture of that later. But Anyway, he proposed to develop it and that never, that never happened. It did become a, a camp, but not after what was known as the Battle of Lake Ripuam. And let's, let's, you know what? I'm gonna go back to this for a minute and just say um, eventually the, um, the land was bought by um, Westchester County and they proposed, they did some condemnation, condemnation and they bought the property. So they had over a thousand acres and they proposed to build a summer camp for um, dis, um, disabled and, and disadvantaged children from lower Westchester, which it did happen, and these are the house, these are the cabins that were used uh, for the camp. The camp uh, was was in was extant from about 1965 to um, 1994, um, and it it served as a camp for disadvantaged and disabled youth, and also as a summer camp. Before it was a summer camp, and when it was just Ground just just a walk about mountain walk about mountain. Uh, who know it had it had several strange beings or thing uh, structures on that property. This is a stone stone structure that um, has nobody really knows what it was built for. It faces east. Uh, it has now, because of safety, they've, they've barred it up. It used to be until a couple of years ago, you could go inside. It's the most amazing, amazing building. All stone built into the side of the hill, a huge lintel stone across the top. And these structures are seen throughout uh, New England and the North and Northeast. Uh, they're also seen in uh, the British Isles. It has uh, well, it's got it's got a sod roof on top, but inside uh, it has what's called a corbel roof, which um, is rocks so positioned that they form they form an arch rather than a keystone arch. It's called a corbel arch, and this is the inside um, of that of that structure. Now, what it was used for? It's it's no, it's everybody's guess. Was it a root cellar built by the far, a farmer back in the, uh, the uh, age of the, the 1700s of the European settlers? Was it 
built as um, the New England Antiquity Society likes to think of, possibly going back as far as the time of the, the Celts or if the Vikings ever came to this country, um, they came to Newfoundland, did they ever get all the way down the East Coast as far as our wonderful little area? Who knows, but it does, it does have an Eastern view and it does have a um, look out here and a look out here, which is there's now stones in it. Um, did it, did it um, look toward the sunrise on either the winter solstice or the spring solstice? Not, not quite, quite known, but a great, great for speculation. Uh, it's just off the main road, the camp road, that goes through the park. So um, if you uh, need directions on where to find it, but it's, not, it's also on one of the trails, but not really pointed out. Uh, we're gonna go up onto the mountainside that overlooks Lake Ripawam and Oscalita. And here we have a lady named Sarah Bishop. This is another one of our legends. There really was a person named Sarah Bishop. How and why she came to live in a cave overlooking Lake Ripawam, we don't know. She came, she first was known or mentioned in 1780 in diaries. Now, one story is that she was raped and, uh, and pillaged and, and, and done terrible things to by the British soldiers in her home on Long Island. So she decided she needed to get away. So somehow she found her way to Salem and she found her way to West Mountain and she found her way to a cave that overlooked Lake Ripawam. And because in those days you could see forever, uh, she could see back to her home on Long Island, across the Long Island Sound. Uh, she lived as a hermitess, as a recluse for 30 years from 1780 till about 1810 when she froze to death in a snowstorm. However, was living on the mountain, she had all sorts of friends. She had a pet crow, she had tamed a rattlesnake, and she had a pet fox. She also did have a garden. She had a pear tree. She had, she apparently cultivated pumpkins and squash. She had a small garden. Uh, and this is her cave behind her. Actually, this is the only place that I know of in town uh, that does still harbor copperheads, uh, known as uh, red adders in the old days. Uh, but yes, there are still copperheads to be found in mountain lakes, as far as I know. Here's her cave circa uh, 1880, 1900. Uh, there is some graffiti which uh, since it's all from the 1800s, it's kind of historic graffiti. It's interesting to go in there and into the cave and, and read what um, people have written. Uh, one day I was there in a, snow, a slight snowstorm with Ken Saltez and another, another uh, ranger from one of, from uh, Ward Pound Ridge Park and, and we were hiking up in there and it had snowed just very faintly. And so we were, we were actually climbing around and we were up here on the top of the, of the cave and the snow had served to uh, pinpoint some more graffiti from about 1889. Uh, it was just initials and the date. And Ken Saltez, who grew up on a camp on Lake, Os on Lake Oscalita, had and this, this was his backyard. I mean, this is where he spent all of his days. And since he was, he grew up to become a herpetologist and a naturalist, uh, he was always in the woods. And in all his years, had never seen this graffiti. So we felt very excited to have found that graffiti after years and uh, 300, 200 years of net, not ever knowing it was there. Uh, this was a picture that I took of the cave about 1990. Uh, it's hard to believe that a woman spent 30 years of her life here. In the winter, she would put pine boughs, pine boughs and branches and, and would close it in. Uh, it has a self-facing opening so that she would get that sun. Uh, and here's another picture. This is my daughter, Katie, from, uh, she, from her, I think she's probably about 12 here. This picture was, 
probably again from about 1994. But I, I put it in to show you <clears throat> that this is a child. She's probably about five feet tall. And this is the cave. So the cave is only about three feet deep. And this, this is what our friend Sarah Bishop would have been living in for 30 years of her life. Sarah dressed in rags, but on Sunday, she would come down from her mountain, travel Oscalita Road into the town of South Salem and go to the Presbyterian Church for services. And this is the house she would stop at. This was the Hoyt farm, now the home of the, of the Cassios. But she would stop here. She kept her good clothes in the trunk here and change into her church going outfit, go to church, then come back, stop at the Hoyts, change back into her, her rags and climb back up to her mountain retreat. Now, this is the home that H.B. Anderson built for his family, his two sons and his wife, overlooking uh, Lake, the Three Lakes area. It's uh, now in Mountain Lakes Park. It's in a part, in a, on a little, the end of a hike called Lookout Point. Uh, it had a number of rooms, probably almost 20 rooms, and it was quite elegant. It was built around 1900. He had already finished his work in Ridgefield, and he was a, a wealthy man. He had a house on Long Island, but he built this house uh, hoping it to be his, his, his family's home. But his wife took sick shortly after they moved in, and she died. So uh, H.B. H. and his sons abandoned the house and moved to their estate on Long Island. And the house fell into abandonment, fell into, dis into dis despair. This picture, as near as I can figure, was probably taken around in the, in the 40s. This is Amelda Attridge, the one who uh, gave me a picture, this picture. Uh, although other people have the picture as well. Mel, Mel's family uh, grew up around uh, the Three Lakes area. And this is a picture she took as the house was a place where teenagers and people like to hike to because it was left another one of these places, places pretty much left as is. I like this picture. It shows a different side of the house, uh, but this is the driveway that if you hike up to Mountain Lake to uh, Lookout Point, this driveway is still is still there, and in the middle is this kind of garden area. Ah, uh, but H. B. Anderson was successful in building the Port of Missing Men, which is actually in North Salem. Um, but you can hike hike to the area going through Mountain Lakes Camp and come out onto uh, North uh, North Salem proper and uh, building is no longer there but um, the uh, a lot of those Italian workers who came to build the roads through his his estate and build the um, the waterworks for uh, Richfield worked in the hotel in the uh, the port of missing men for him this is a picture of the inside what the uh, the restaurant would have looked like in 1934. It was a tea house, but um, it was known that other libations were served there during prohibition. And uh, it was known as a possible place to, uh, if you wanted to hold a, a, a little company meeting, you would uh, sneak away to the uh, Port of Missing Men. It was only about, oh, 40 minute, half uh, to an hour drive from White Plains and thereabouts, and a good place to hold your uh, non-tea libation meeting. This is looking out from the other, from uh, what from from the port of missing men, looking out across the fields of North Salem. Those were the good old days in the 1930s before everything was developed. And here we go again to what Lake Wakabuck looked like from Lookout Point. And this was, I would say probably 1930s, it's a colorized postcard. I can't quite figure out what this is here, so I'm just going to ignore it. But this is Lake Wakabuck. And this is, as I said, it's probably the 20s or the 30s. And this 
we come to a summer, a winter's sunset. I took this picture uh, within the last year or so. And this is from the exact same vantage point. If we go back for a minute, here's the lake. And here's the picture that I took in 2000, I don't know, 19. 2020 out over the lake on a winter's winter's evening you can see houses down here but you can see the same walk a buck so that i thank you very much for uh, being part of our tour around the hamlets of of lewisboro and if you are in the area and if you have never ever done it please take the time to visit mountain lakes park uh, it's free Westchester County hasn't discovered they could put a toll booth up there yet, although I hear they're thinking of it. Um, lots of great hikes. And the hike to this lookout reminds me of a number of hikes that I've taken in, in the national parks that I've been to. You're at least 500 feet above sea level and you're looking out on an expanse uh, toward the Hudson, toward uh, uh, Hound Ridge Reservation. And the other way, you're looking out toward um, Truesdale and Wilson and, and New Canaan. Uh, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous view. So uh, get on your hiking boots and try a hike out to Lookout Point and many of the other wonderful hikes in Mountain Lakes Camp. So I bid you adieu. I hope you had fun. And uh, maybe in the fall, we'll take some more zooming, zooming uh, hikes. Have a good rest of oh, the wait, day. Oh, wait, Maureen, where are you going? We got lots of questions for you before. Oh, I'm you... not going. I was just wrapping up. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> no questions today. It's so oh, late. Oh, no. What's... I think this might be the most questions we've gotten. Oh, and actually, it's before five. Okay, I feel good. <laughs> Except my um, phone has been ringing. I don't know who wants. I must have questions on my phone, but I'll take yours first. Okay. Can you define rambling? rambling oh you mean from the from the victorian era yep yeah you would be uh probably dressed like those people on the bridge you saw them uh in their uh their rustic costumes not their city costumes and they would be walking and they would be walking you know probably through places like what i was just trying to get you to go to mount lakes uh, walking the country roads, walking the farm lanes, and then they would be back in time to to sup at seven. Um, and in Wakabuck, they could walk along Mead Street. There are all those beautiful houses and uh, uh, the lakes, not, I'm sorry, the roads were all dirt. So you really, it was easier to walk and people walked, they walked from Golden's Bridge to Wakabuck. Uh, so yeah, I think a ramble was to take a, maybe take a picnic and uh, just walk the, the byways and uh, enjoy the after the country air with no mos no well there were mosquitoes but there wasn't any malaria. That's okay. how I describe rambling. That's what they kind that's what they kind of uh, figured out uh, that it was either walking or hiking. Yeah, yeah, but they would probably have been dressed similar to what you saw. Okay, wait, there's a live question for you before I go back to uh, <laughs> the dead ones. Oh. No, my I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's from Mrs. Vlacos. Can you hear us? I, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, I can't hear Elaine, though. You, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. When you, when you showed the picture of our outhouse, I, I had to uh, laugh because th th everybody around here is proud of their outhouses. Most of us keep our uh, Christmas trees and, and uh, all kinds of tools and stuff in them. But that one is a special one for us and it's in very good condition and we keep it in good condition because we enjoy it. I'm so glad you're on Elaine because I didn't want to, I think you're out that outhouses on the South shore are just amazing. And I, I didn't show all the pictures that we took that day, but uh, uh, yeah, all the outhouses are just, are just wonderful and in good condition and used for so many things. 
Thank you so much. This was wonderful, Maureen. Wonderful. And I'm, and I'm so glad you got on. I was worried last night from your email. <laughs> nope, I made it. Good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to the written questions. I'm sorry, that was the wrong adjective. Okay. No worry. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any inns or hotels in uh, the Wakabuck area today that are operating? No, no. Any cabins, motels, or campsites? B and B's. Uh, well, yeah, I guess whoever had uh, there might be Airbnbs that I don't have a clue about. Um, there are campsites at Mountain Lakes, and there are campsites at um, uh, the reservation. Pound Ridge. But yeah, Mountain Lakes does have campsites. And uh, when we were walking there last night, we saw a lot of cars coming in. So I think they were having parties. <laughs> uh, this question. Oh, 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 and Mountain Lakes too. Um, I don't suppose that you can do it now, but before the pandemic, they redid one of their, they put a lot of money into one of their camping areas. And uh, you can have your wedding there at this wonderful uh, um, uh, event place. You have to bring in your own caterer, but you can rent uh, a room, uh, I mean, a, uh, a, a building that must, must accommodate at least 100, and you can rent a yurt village. Uh, each yurt has about a room for 8 to 12 people, and so you can have your whole you can have a wedding weekend with the yurt village. The You can't swim in the lake, but um, you can ramble and you can do all sorts of other things. So uh, when things open up, if anybody's considering a wedding or an event, um, check the county, county website for uh, the Mountain Lakes uh, event place. Okay, yeah, actually, that's my commercial. One of the uh, camp staff of mine got married there a couple of year, years ago. Great place. It is. Uh, this always comes to a phone call to the park and rec every year. Why, I don't know, but the Mead Chapel, there are no services today, like today being offered on a weekly basis, COVID or no COVID, right? No, no, it, it's, it's a, you know, it's a family, a, a, it's a private chapel, uh, but they were during summer. I mean, I don't know if they do it now because uh, I wouldn't be involved at all, but uh, um, for a long time, they did have Sunday services that were for the Wakabuck community and I guess other people if they knew about it. But St. Mary's in Katona did uh, have services there for a number of years and that was back in the, uh, well, at least was in the 70s so St. Mary's did use it. The priest would come over and, uh, and uh, say mass every Sunday. And that was for a, a number of years. And uh, I, I think I remember Don Lyons Minot's talking about going there. Um, the last thing I was there, went to there was a, a, some, was a, a celebration. But I know they, they had concerts uh, a few years ago. They were having they were often having concerts that were open and you know that were fundraisers that were open to the public is it associated with like a catholic church or is it no no it's, it's non-denominational it, i can't talk today yeah, no, it is non-denominational um but as i mentioned in all my rambling talk um the Union Theological Seminary in the city provided a lot of the pat the uh, the ministers who would come out to do the services. So it, I don't know whether that's a Presbyterian or whether Union Seminary is is a non denominational, but basically it was Protestant, not Catholic, but um, the Catholics did use it. So by, so because it's a family one. No, like public, ma like marriages, no. baptisms, funerals can be used in there. Uh, I don't think so, but you would have to contact the, the, uh, the, the association that, that administers it. 
Do you personally have any pictures of the inside of it? Uh, no, because I never took pictures of the inside. Okay. And is oh, there no. a burial grounds around the church? Not around the church. No, the Mead Cemetery is at the beginning of, of Mead Street down by Route 35. There never were any burial grounds up there. Except, and not the elephant. They put him in the lake. Because his barn was there, apparently, before the chapel. Okay, getting off the chapel now. Heading to uh, back to Lake Wakabuck. Was there an ice house on Lake Wakabuck that provided the ice from the lake? Yep, down on the western. I didn't really, you know, I had so much. I didn't talk about that. But uh, a bunch of years ago, David Mead took me down there. He was... Um, a cousin of Susan Henry's and uh, one of another one of the uh, last of the Mead family to uh, have residence there and he brought me down to show me they had a waterworks down there and the ice house uh, and I think some of the equipment from the waterworks is still is still down um, at the western end of the lake so yeah there was an ice house down there Okay, a lovely lady from Golden's Bridge is redirecting me back to the chapel. Okay. Um, who runs the Mead Chapel Association or how could they find out more about it? Oh, I hate to, I hate to put the onus on her, but I my contact is Susan Henry. And Susan Henry is uh, into her 90s now? She's in her, her late, I, I think her late 80s, yeah. Okay middle to late 80s. Susan probably, <laughs> probably the best thing is to call the town clerk. She's the information desk. I, I would do that. Otherwise, Mrs. James Henry, and I think her name is in the phone book. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to go back off the chapel. Okay. <clears throat> um, the story about Rachel being stood up on her wedding day. Sad, sad story. Oh, it is. Yeah. Uh, where was Rachel's house that she became a recluse in? Okay, it's, you're on Oscalita Road, you've gone, oh, you're getting, you, you're down to Old Pond Road, Old Pond Road, you're almost to uh, Mountain Lakes, the hill up to Mountain Lakes Camp. You've uh, come to the Old Pond Road, Old Pond goes off to the left, the road curves up the hill toward, uh, toward Mountain Lakes Camp, and I didn't, and the house was right on that corner there. You can still see a uh, foundation of the structure, whether it was the house or maybe a barn that went with the house, but it's right on that corner. Um, don't have to, uh, I should. All right, this, this is the, the hill going up to Mountain, the start of the hill. Of course it's winter, so it's all snow going up to Mountain Lakes Camp. And here's, you'd go around this corner and you'd be at Mountain Lakes. This is just off the side of this picture is where uh, maybe a maybe hundred yards down here would be where the Grumman house was. You can uh, identify it is, if anybody knows where Laura Eisner used to, um, Eisler lived, <clears throat> uh, she's moved away now, but they uh, lived in a, modern colonial house that they painted bright yellow. So if you're on Oscalita Road and you're about to go up the hillside and you uh, see a bright yellow house just west of that house is uh, where the Grumman family lived. Okay, I th think that might be it unless anyone has any live questions that they would like to ask. You can unmute yourself. Raise your hand and I can unmute you. Oh. I th uh, maybe your friend, Suzanne, do you wanna talk? Shake your head. She's waving. Hang on, I'm gonna unmute her. Okay.
Okay, where's my view? Can I hit view? Oh, there I you just go. want to know who won the lunch bet. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sue is in on our little agreement there. Oh, well, now we got to tell the world. Yeah, I guess Maureen so. And I bet a lunch every uh, Zoom to see how many people uh, show up to our Zooms. The sun is out, so we didn't get as many as we hoped today, but <laughs> 70 people signed up. Our over under is 37. We were under 37, Sue. Okay. So Maureen wins another lunch off of me. Oh, wait, well, maybe I'll share again. Maybe it's my turn. So you need to come east and you can come to lunch with us. We'll have fun. I love it. I'm sorry I have to watch my beloved country from the Midwest. Well, take care of your pigeons and your crows and your, your raccoons. We know you're so busy out there. Bye-bye. So long. Thanks for coming. Okay, I think that's it, Maureen. We thank everybody. Oh. Oh, was George Mead for Oh wait, I don't know if you're gonna be able to answer this. I don't know if they're playing right. around with me or not. Okay. Um what? well they just asked if uh the president of oh no, no, she said I'm not playing. Was the uh, George Meade from Brooklyn, who was the president of the railroad, a direct relative to the Wackabuck Meads? He was the Wackabuck Meade. George, he was the one that built Harriet and left uh, and the other and the uh, Lakeview Cottage. He was the great grandson of Enoch Meade. He was a big mover and shaker. So my lovely friend in Goldsbridge, sorry I doubted you that you weren't being serious. <laughs> okay, I think that's now officially it. Okay. We, we thank everyone, especially those who hung out for uh, 11 weeks, I think, with us to doing these Zooms. We greatly appreciate it. We're going to give Maureen a break for the spring and summer and Hopefully I could uh, twist her arm a little bit to come back in the fall to do a few more because I think we're going to hold on, the town's holding on to Zoom to make it easy for people to access meetings. So we'll keep using it as a, as a vehicle for our programming. But if anyone has any great ideas for future Zooms, uh, feel free to reach out to me or Maureen. Um, and we hope to go back uh, to uh, in the fall to do another series like this. So if there's something that you want more information about, please let us know. Have a great Sunday, everybody. Take care. Right. <laughs> Hello, Polly. <laughs> All right, are we done? Almost. <laughs>